Happy to have everybody here. Um, hopefully you all can see my slides. Um, and I just wanted just like uh, uh, to know what we'll do is, you know, we're gonna talk today obviously about egg freezing uh, 101. Um, I'm gonna go through a bunch of slides and just sort of talk about um, egg freezing, the basics of it, the process, et cetera. Um, we do have um, a Q and A box um, that you'd be able to, um, uh, to utilize to put in questions. Um, I'll go through everything and then I'll take a look at the Q and A box at the end and go through sort of live all the uh, questions I'm able to answer, um, uh, time permitting, of course. Um, all right, so uh, again, I'm Dr. Robert Zen. Um, I am a double board certified uh, OBGYN and REI, Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility Specialist, um, and um, part of RMA in New York, Reproductive Medicine Associates of New York. Um, I uh, um, uh, myself am located in our Brooklyn location, um, and uh, but we have offices in New York and uh, Manhattan, a couple actually um, in Long Island, Westchester, sort of all over the area. Um, and again, we'll be speaking today about egg freezing. All right. All right. So the, you know, again, what we'll talk about in general is egg freezing, how it works, why it works, um, answer any old questions that people have. Um, this just is sort of gives like a gestalt of essentially what the process of egg freezing is like. Um, really, really just sort of bird's eye view. The eggs are within the ovary. We extract eggs and then we isolate them and put them in uh, into liquid nitrogen and we, we freeze them. Um, the you know purpose of egg freezing really is about sort of harnessing our reproductive potential. And you do it at a time where you're younger um, for use in the future. So this is a category um, of treatment that we call fertility preservation. We're trying to save for the future and to keep our options uh, open and more broad for the future. Um, it allows people to take a bit of control over uh, the family building process. And I really look at this as sort of an investment. Um, some people say it's like an insurance policy or as a backup and whatnot. I see it more so as an investment in the future. Um, and again, allows a bit more control, flexibility, et cetera, in terms of plan, uh, family planning. Um, and the reason why we think of it that way is that when you're younger, your reproductive potential is a lot, lot higher. Um, people peak in terms of their reproductive potential in their mid twenties and quality and quantity of eggs um, go down with time. Um, and so when we freeze eggs at a younger state, they re maintain that reproductive potential even later on. So when we think about eggs, we think about them really in two major ways. There's the quality of the eggs, how good are they? And then there's the quantity, how many are there? So for the quantity, the number of eggs that you have, everyone's born all the eggs that they'll ever have, and they slowly get used up with time. And the, there's actually a pretty big decline uh, that happens in eggs, um, even before we're born. Um, so the peak amount of eggs that, that anybody has is actually when they're about halfway through gestation, meaning you're in your mother's uterus, and that's sort of the peak amount of eggs that you ever have, about 20 weeks of gestation, 20 weeks into the pregnancy, about six, seven million eggs. By the time you're born, that number's down to one to two million. By the time you hit puberty, you're down to about a couple of hundred thousand. Um, and over a reproductive lifespan, um, there will be roughly 400 eggs that are going to ovulate over the, over the course of a, of a reproductive lifespan. So there's just a massive, massive attrition that happens with time, very inefficient process. Um, but this is just nature and what it is. Um, and again, so when the sort of the younger you are, the more eggs that you have, and so we're just trying to capitalize on, on, on what the body has at that time. And that's the quantity. Now, quality of eggs is something that also goes down with time. The idea here is that each egg comes, the eggs come forward every single month. And as the eggs are coming forward during the menstrual cycle, the egg, the cell of the egg has to split into a half. Right, every cell in the body is made up of two sets of DNA, one that you got from, from, from mom, one from dad. And in order to create 
an egg, your DNA has to split in half. And as time goes on, that process becomes less efficient and there's more, it's more prone to errors in that splitting process. And so you may end up, instead of a clean 50-50, half the DNA goes to one cell, half, you know, and half splits, you may end up with an abnormal amount of DNA that happens in the egg that's coming forward for that month. Same sort of thing can happen at the level of sperm, different timeline, different, uh, different conversation. The focus here obviously is, is going to be on what's going on with eggs. Now, peak fertility or peak reproductive potential, as I mentioned before, is in sort of the mid-20s and actually is relatively stable um, in the mid-20s into the early 30s. So this is a graph that shows the rate of abnormal eggs that happen with age. And so it's, you can see it sort of curves in the teens, early 20s. The body is still sort of learning how to do this process well. And then in the early to mid 20s, it's the, at its peak efficiency um, in terms of not having errors. Remember, these are abnormal uh, eggs, meaning abnormal amount of DNA. But then as time goes on and we cross into the later half of the 30s, the rate of abnormal eggs starts to rise pretty sharply. And then into the early 40s, um, uh, goes down even more quickly, goes up even more quickly. And in, again, by the age 44, 45, it becomes so high that the chances of a, of a natural pregnancy at that time um, are of extremely, extremely low. And so if you freeze eggs, say at age 30, um, and you're ready to use them at age 43, your potential for those eggs stays exactly as if you, they, you even though you are 43, the eggs are, have the potential of a 30 year old. And so that's the whole idea behind uh, freezing eggs is that the, young, the younger is healthy as they'll ever be now. And when you freeze them now, you can use them in the future. So I spoke about eggs and how, you know, and quality and quantity, quality of the eggs really is dictated by age quantity of eggs, um, again, is something that goes down with time, but it's like a bell curve. Most people, everyone's born all the eggs they ever have, but some people are born with an average amount of eggs. Some people are born with very, with fewer than average eggs. Some people are born with higher than average eggs. And how many eggs you have ultimately predicts how many eggs you may end up getting from an egg freezing cycle. So how do I know, or how do we know how many eggs you may have and how many eggs you can expect to get if say you decide that you want to go through an egg freezing cycle? So we have some testing that we can do for this, called ovarian reserve testing. There's three things that we check, two of which are sort of the more important ones, um, which are an AFC and an AMH. AFC stands for antral follicle count, which I'll explain in a moment, and AMH is anti-mullerian hormone. So overall, your ovarian function or egg, um, egg function really revolves around different things that, that we test for. One, age is, is an important one. Again, the younger you are, the higher the numbers of, of eggs that you'll have. Um, the antral follicle count, which is one test that we do, which is a vaginal ultrasound that takes a look at the ovaries and counts how many eggs the body is bringing forward. Your AMH hormone that I mentioned, and another hormone called FSH. This one is important, but more so in context of low egg numbers and sort of stratifying uh, diminished ovarian reserve but the antropolitan and AMH are important ones. So AMH, so when you come to see, you know, for a fertility evaluation prior to getting started with freezing eggs, what happens essentially is that we meet with a physician just like myself, they, we take a medical history and just to get a, a, you know, a sense of, of what's going on in terms of your, your you know, medical condition, make sure there's no contraindications to, to things and whatnot or any issues with anesthesia, et cetera. And then we do some fertility testing. We check what's the status of our eggs. So we do blood work and we do a vaginal ultrasound. That all that happens um, when you have your initial consultation, or if you're doing it virtually via Zoom, uh, we have you come in and, and do that for uh, uh, so that we can test your your egg numbers. So AMH is a hormone that's made by the ovary. It's made by the follicles, the sac that has the egg inside. It can be tested anytime during your menstrual cycle. It uh, doesn't fluctuate over the course of the menstrual cycle. Um, it helps us in sort of getting a sense of what the overall um, response to medication may be. Because for egg freezing, we have to stimulate your ovaries to grow eggs. It helps us in figuring out what the appropriate dose would be for you so that we can give you the right amount of medication to get as many eggs to grow as we can, but not give you too much medication because that can cause complications. 
So the, it helps us in predicting the response to, to ovarian stimulation. Something to, to flag is that people that have been on birth control pills for a long period of time can cause a false suppression of the AMH. So we may check your AMH and it looks like it's very low and that you have low egg numbers. But then after we stop the pills for say a month, we recheck it and it gives us uh, what your real value is. Um, you really want this number to be over one. Um, normal, consider normal uh, values are between 0 0.7 to 3.5, but I would say, uh, you know, in the textbook, but I would say over one is what we want to have. I love seeing that number between two and three. Anything that's, you know, less than one or in the 0 point something range um, is considered diminished ovarian reserve. The egg numbers that you have do not predict your ability to naturally conceive. So some people may have gotten their AMH checked with their GYN and it's low or high or whatever have you. Um, if you have two people who say are 30 years old, just to uh, keep it simple, and one has a completely quote unquote normal AMH value and the other has a low, uh, has a low AMH, has diminished ovarian reserve low egg numbers. And the two of them have regular periods once a month and they both decide that they're going to start trying to get pregnant, uh, um, you know, that day. Over the next six months, they have the exact same of naturally getting pregnant. AMH, the egg numbers, do not predict your ability to naturally conceive. It is predicted by more so by your age. What it does tell us this hormone is how you may respond to, medic to medication and how many eggs you may end up getting from, from the stimulation. We combine that information with what's called an antral follicle count. So this is a very zoomed in picture of an ultrasound image of the ovary. So this whole uh, structure here uh, that I'm outlining is the ovary. And these black circles here, 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 here et cetera, those are what are called follicles. A follicle is a fluid filled sac that has the egg inside. So within this circle here, there's one tiny microscopic egg and then this one and then that one and then that one. The, idea is that, so the, and this, when we do an ultrasound, we see how many eggs the body is bringing forward. It gives us a sense of what the underlying numbers are. The concept here is that your ovary is like a vault. And in the vault is all the eggs that you'll ever have. At the beginning of the menstrual cycle, the door to the vault opens and a handful of eggs come out. And this is what we're seeing on this ultrasound. This is the handful of eggs that come out at the beginning of a menstrual cycle. Now, what naturally happens is that the body will choose one of these eggs. And again, there's two ovaries, I'm only showing one ovary, but the body say will choose this egg, for example, this egg will become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and will ultimately ovulate and release. And that's your dominant follicle, the, right? The dominant, the prevalent egg. And that's the one that grows and releases. All these other eggs that month are gonna die off. All we're trying to do when we're doing stimulation of your ovaries to grow the eggs, so for egg freezing, is that we're basically exposing your body to the same hormone that it makes in order to get this egg to grow. And we just want to try to get all these eggs to grow. So we're basically going to try to salvage or save the eggs that the body would have wasted that month. So when we freeze eggs, so say we go through a cycle and get, you know, averages 13 eggs, we get 13 eggs, say, we're not taking away from your future eggs. We're really just salvaging what the body would have wasted that month. And again, so again, doing the combination of this of the hormone test plus the follicle count is going to help us in, in you know, knowing how many eggs we may expect to get from the stimulation. All right. So you have your initial consultation. You, you know, meet with the doctor, get the all your histories done. You get your blood work done to check your hormones. You have your ultrasound to see how many eggs you know, where we're looking at now, how does the actual process work? So I did speak a bit about this in terms of the concept behind what we're doing. So this is like a little biology 101 going back to, to high school and college and whatnot. But basically, this is the brain. The brain sends signals to the pituitary gland or the hypothalamus sends to, to, to different parts of the brain, basically. And there's a gland within the brain that sends out hormones called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Remember follicle is the sac that has the egg stimulating hormone, it stimulates the follicle to grow, which then this hormone talks to the ovary where the eggs are and it stimulates the ovary to grow an egg. 
and that ovary then makes estrogen and it feeds back and there's sort of like a loop and this is how your body naturally makes um, naturally makes a uh, um, an egg every month that grows an egg. All we're doing is exposing your body to more of this hormone, the same natural hormone that your body makes. Again, your body only makes enough of this hormone to get one egg to grow a month. We're exposing your body to it at a higher level so that instead of growing one egg, we can get as many eggs to grow as we can. That's the concept of what we're doing. So, and that just sort of just like visually shows it. This is what your ovary looks like at baseline, the beginning of a menstrual cycle. In a natural cycle, when I mentioned before, you have a dominant follicle. So one egg that grows larger and the rest are small and these ultimately die off. When we stimulate your ovary for egg freezing, we're trying to get all the eggs to grow. And so you can see there's a lot of big, uh, these black circles here. And that's the concept of what we're trying to do. So what's the timeline? What's, the, what's involved in the process? Um, so essentially it start, there's, the first phase of the egg freezing journey starts with what we call synchronization. We're trying to get your ovaries, your eggs, to be all the same starting size. You see those black circles, some are a little bigger, some are a little smaller. We want them all to be the same size. We do that with a couple of different way, uh, methods. The most, com most common way we do it is actually to put you on a short course, maybe a week or two of birth control pills. Birth sounds counterintuitive, right? I'm going on birth control pills, I'm trying to freeze eggs. But one of the side effects of birth control pills is that it helps get your, uh, again, your eggs to be about the same size so we can then get them to grow all together. It's not just pills that we use. Sometimes we use an estrogen patch or different things. It really depends on your hormone profile. Um, it's how we synchronize your eggs or get your eggs to be at about the same size. So life just resumes as normal, again, over the, that week or two. And then you come in for an ultrasound and blood work. And we start the next phase, which is the stimulation. This is when we're stimulating your ovaries to grow the eggs. This is the meat of egg freezing. This is the thing that you'll hear about and people talk about. This is the hormone injections. So the hormone you're injecting, again, is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, that same hormone the body naturally makes, just exposing to your body to it at a higher level. The, it starts off... Um, with two injections a day, and these are what are called subcutaneous injections. They're tiny little needles. They go into your belly. You do these at home two times a day, um, once in the morning, once in the evening, and you barely feel these going in. They're very, very similar to insulin. Um, if you know anyone that takes insulin, say for diabetes, really tiny needles go into the belly. We show you how to do it so you can feel comfortable and just send you home with a bunch of needles and say good luck. Um, but those, the hormone injections are, are what's going to get the eggs to grow. Average number of days that you're doing hormone injections is about 12. Now, you may be, maybe your eggs are ready after 10 days of, of, of injections, or maybe or nine, or maybe 13 or 14. Average is 12. So I always, you know, tell people to go in, assuming it's going to be about two weeks of daily hormone injections. Now, during those two weeks of hormone injections, you come to the office pretty frequently. It ends up being like maybe seven, eight times or so during that two week time process. Um, so it's a pretty intensive sort of time just because you're having these hormone injections that you're doing at baseline. Um, and then you also have frequent appointments. Now we always do these appointments in the early part of the morning, usually starting at like 7 a.m. or so. Um, they're about 30 minutes door to door. We do blood work to check your hormone levels and we do a vaginal ultrasound to check how the follicles are growing, how the eggs are growing. Because we want to make sure that we're giving you enough medication to get as many eggs to grow as we can. But on the flip side, we can't give you too much medication because that can put you at risk for something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Basically a condition where hormone levels get so revved up that it can cause complications like fluid retention around the lungs and predisposed to blood clots and things like that. And so first do no harm, we have to make sure we're doing this in a safe way. And so that's why we have to keep a close eye and monitor your response. And we get blood work results the same day and we, it's like a dial pen. We can go up and go down, titrate on the dose that we're doing uh, to make sure that we're getting the most optimal and safe response. Um, so again, two weeks of, of these twice a day and then about halfway through, we introduce a third injection. It's still taken two times a day, but just an extra injection. The extra injection you take about halfway through, 
uh, prevents your body from ovulating on its own, from releasing the eggs on its own, because we need to be in control of when that happens. We don't want you, you know, we don't want you to release the eggs and then we don't capture them. Um, now, during that time, you know, obviously that you're doing the injections, we, again, you barely feel those going in. You're getting poked for the hormones. You have the ultrasounds that are going on also. Um, but again, there's an early morning, about 30 minutes, you get to work and whatnot. Um, how are you going to feel during that time? For the first, so of those, you know, two weeks, for the first week is going to be primarily um, feeling fatigue and headache are the most common things. Um, for the latter half, it's bloating. Um, as hormone levels go up and, you know, and, and ovaries are getting bigger, um, you're going to feel more full. Uh, your body is retaining fluids and the ovaries are getting larger. Um, and when the ovaries are large, again, during that second half of the, of the stimulation, if the ovaries are moving around too much, it can flip on itself. So they call it ovarian torsion. So during the stimulation for the second half, we have to have you sort of take it easy. So we avoid moderate or high intensity exercise, avoiding penetrative intercourse. Um, it's just sort of like a take it easy sort of time. Life resumes as normal. You go on, you know, walking around doing your thing, um, but just not running around and, 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 and being excessive with things. Um, and then once we see that enough of the follicles are large enough where the eggs should be mature, you do one last injection that's called a trigger injection or the trigger shot. That causes the final maturation process of the egg. And then we time that set exactly 36 hours later, we do the egg retrieval, the procedure to take the egg out. So again, it may be that you're ready after 10 days or 11 days or 12 or what have you. You'll always have a two day heads up on when the egg retrieval is gonna be the procedure to take the eggs out. It is a day that you need off from work um, because you're gonna have a procedure under anesthesia. It's about 15 minutes of light sedation. So it's just an IV in your arm um, no, you know, no like breathing tube or anything like that. You're just sort of in a twilight for about 15 minutes. So you won't you remember, you won't feel pain. The way it works is that a needle goes through the vaginal wall into the ovary to get the eggs out. Um, there, and again, very low risk of any complication or anything like that. That day we tell you how many eggs we got. Then we had a call the next day, tell you how many of those eggs ended up being mature and frozen. And you get a period of one to two weeks after the eggs come out. Um, and by that time, the ovaries have shrunk that back down to their normal size and you can just resume normal life at that time. Now, how the, this just gives like a visual depiction of how the procedure works. Again, you're under anesthesia for this, but basically we use an ultrasound and attached to the ultrasound is a needle guide that allows us to get a needle from the, through the vaginal wall into the ovary where the eggs are in order to aspirate the eggs out from, from the fluid that's, um, that's surrounding it. On an ultrasound, I showed you some ultrasound uh, pictures before. This is a stimulated ovary. Um, all these black circles are the eggs. This right, short, this right here is a needle that's in there, in the follicle, and we drain the fluid and we hope that we catch the egg. And when the egg comes out, this is what it looks like under a microscope. This is a mature egg. It has sort of this like halo around it over here. Um, this is uh, like the shell around the egg. And then this actual black circle is the, is the egg itself. And that's what gets frozen in time. It's the eggs are all stored in what's called liquid nitrogen. It's negative 196 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit. It's, it's, you know, kept here. We keep them in house. Um, uh, stored, there's like a hundred thousand safety measures to ensure that the eggs are kept uh, safe and that there's a constant supply, backup generators and all that sort of thing, um, alarms, etc. cetera. Um, there's no shelf life on storage of eggs. Um, you know, they, there's no freezer burn that happens with them. Um, as you know, we feel egg, egg freezing has been around for a non-experimental egg freezing, meaning that it's, it's no, got lifted from its experimental status about 12 or so years ago, about 2012, 2013. Um, and so we know we have a good amount of confidence um, since that time, at least, that you know, eggs that are frozen over the course of a decade do well. Um, we know from embryos that are frozen the longest amount of time an embryo has been frozen that's resulted in a live born pregnancy is about 30 years. We don't have that far amount of information about eggs, um, but you know, it probably is pretty similar. Um, 
the success that you have depends on the age that you were at the time that the eggs were frozen, not at the times that you, not based on the, on the age that you are when you come back to use them. Uh, the risks of the stimulation egg freezing process, as I, imagine, as I mentioned before, are very low. Um, uh, there's hyperstimulation, meaning too much hormones in the body. Um, ovarian torsion, the ovary twisting on itself. Again, that's why we have to keep it easy. Procedures related to the uh, complications related to the procedure itself. There's a needle going into the body. There's anesthesia, etc. cetera. Um, again, risk of all these things is very, very low. Um, something that's important is that there's no increase, no evidence of an increased risk for cancer later on or any major um, issues in terms of health for people who, who freeze their eggs. And there's no impact on future fertility. We have pretty good evidence about this for people who do up to about up uh, up until six cycles of stimulation. Beyond that, we don't know as well. Um, ultimately, if coming back to use the eggs, and we always prefer natural conception, obviously, um, if if that's something that's able to happen. If not, then we lean on these eggs. So with the eggs, then in order to use them, what we have to unfreeze the eggs. So uh, you can have either some of the eggs thawed or all the eggs thawed. We have to fertilize them. So we have to basically pick up, this is a, under a microscope, a microscopic needle, and this is a little sperm. The sperm gets picked up into a microscopic needle and then directly injected into the egg because the shell around the egg becomes a bit hard from the freezing and thawing process. So we have to help the sperm and the egg join together in the lab. We then grow an embryo in the, in the lab over the next five days and then we take that embryo and put it into a catheter and put that into the uterus. This is really just like a pap smear. Um, you already did the hard work. So when we transfer the embryo into the uterus, we do a very, very small, delicate uh, catheter. We prepare the lining of the uterus hormonally in order to accept the embryo. So say you want to freeze eggs and we go through the process and all that. So how many eggs do you need to have in order to, to have a baby? Because it's not just a one-to-one -one thing because as I mentioned in the previous slide, you know, eggs have to survive the freezing and thawing process and not all of them do. They have to fertilize and not all of them do. They have to grow into embryos and not all of them do. And then they have to stick when we put the embryo in and not all of them do. So there are a couple of tools out there or ways to sort of think about this. There is um, a, uh, an online tool uh, that was created out of, uh, out of Boston from Harvard. Um, you know, that, that based on their data and sort of gives you like a prediction model where you can put in your age and the number of mature eggs that you got from the cycle. And it'll give you your chances of having at least one kid, two kids, three kids, etc. cetera. Um, you know, so in this example here, being 35 years old with 10 eggs gives you 69% chance of having at least one, 30% uh, having two. But if you are 35 and have double the amount of eggs, you have a 90% chance of having one, 66% chance of having two. So how many eggs you want to have ultimately depends on how many eggs you want to, you know, how many children you ultimately are thinking of having and using the eggs. And we don't know if you're going to need these eggs for one kid, two kids, three kids, zero kids. Um, again, this is just sort of investment in those options. Another way of looking at this um, that I think gives a you know a good visual. Say you go through a cycle, um, average number of mature eggs you may get from one cycle of egg freezing is about 13. So if say you are in the 30 to 34 age range, this is basically information that tells you based on your age group, 30 to 34, 35 to 37, et cetera, et cetera, your chance of having based on the number of mature eggs that you have frozen, your chance of blue line at least one kid, red line two, green line three. So if you go through one cycle and you have a completely average number of eggs, 13, you can look back at this and say, okay, you can either use that tool I showed last time, or you can say 13 gives me about a 70% chance of having one kid, about a 30% chance of having two, 10% uh, chance of having three. For my, you know, personal family building goals, I'm happy with that. And that's what I'm going to, and my risk tolerance, right, is, uh, is everybody's different. I'm happy with that. And that's what I'm going to do. Or you may say, well, I got this amount, I'm very happy with that, but I really would want more because I wanna to try to get further up on this graph. And so you do another cycle and then you get 26, uh, you know, or whatever have you, there's a knot in a stone, but something to realize is that this blue line will never reach 100%, because there's no guarantees in the process, but we could do pretty good with it. And 
you know, again, the more the merrier is sort of the rule of thumb, particularly if you're at an older age, so we need a lot more eggs in order to feel confident the ability to result in a live birth again, because the quality of eggs changes as we guess, as time goes on. Okay. That is my egg freezing 101 information that I wanted to share with everybody. I'm gonna stop, and this is uh, my information here um, uh, for, for you all to have. Um, again, we're at RMA of New York. Um, you can find us that line at rmany.com. We have locations again, in Brooklyn and the city, Upper East Side, West Side, Soho, Long Island, Westchester, et cetera. Um, and uh, we're all happy to, to help people in their family building journeys. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, I'm going to uh, take a look at our Q&A box and try, try to address some of the things in here. Um, and if anybody has anything, you can continue. Um, okay, so one of our questions was, uh, what percentage of people do egg freezing twice? So this is a very good question. I would say that the majority of people, I can't give an exact percentage, but the bulk of people ends up doing um, more than one cycle of egg freezing, but it really is dependent on what the yield is um, from the first time, your, your age, and the total number of children that that you um, want to that you want to have ultimately, and so again, I, I you know that graph that I just showed at the end, I think is a very helpful tool because where any individual uh, feels comfortable landing on that, um, then uh, you know it is variable depends. But I would say that many people want to have again, depending on the age, about twenty you know twenty eggs or so. Uh, 30 if you're a bit older. So we say, you know, general rule of thumb is we say, you know, if you have 15, to like 15 to 20 eggs um, under the age of 37, that's pretty good. If you, if you're over 38 or above, goal would be more so in the 25 to 30 is, is, is what you want to be. It just depends on how many times it, it takes uh, to get there. Um, and to, sorry, so it's just wrong. Um, next question, uh, when you say quality, does it have to only do with the likelihood of natural pregnancy or the likelihood of babies having disabilities as well? Um, good question. I'll close out something here. Okay. So again, when we say quality, do we mean likelihood of natural pregnancy or likelihood of babies having disabilities? Um, so what I mean by that is the chance of having an egg that has the correct amount of DNA. Um, correct amount of DNA, so most, so most commonly if an egg has an incorrect amount of DNA, that just won't result in a pregnancy. It either won't stick to begin with, or it may stick, start to develop, but because it doesn't have the right amount of DNA, it's incompatible with life and so ends up in a miscarriage. So that's what I mean by quality. And so chances for a miscarriage climb um, into the late 30s, early 40s, because there's a higher proportion of eggs that have this uh, abnormal amount of DNA. Now, the same is true in terms of, of certain conditions that can cause disability. So say, for, and it, you know, an example would be uh, trisomy 21. Having an extra chromosome 21 is an abnormal amount of DNA, but it is something that's compatible with life. That's Down syndrome. Um, and so that increases with age as well. The next question, okay, so the question is, so um, if uh, being on birth control pills up until the egg retrieval is fine, um, has that changed from the past uh, when you had to be off it for months before the retrieval? So this is a very good question, very common question because people have, um, uh, you know, are on birth control pills very commonly, obviously. Um, and that, that are coming for fertility preservation. Now, the decision of whether or not you should continue on birth control pills or to come off them for a little, for a little break really depends on what we're seeing with your hormone levels. Birth control pills, particularly with long use, like more than five years, can in some people, because everyone is, you know, if we individualize this decision or, or I do, 
um, because everybody metabolizes this medication and processes it differently. Um, when we do testing, the ultrasound and the, and the hormones, we can see if it looks like your ovaries are overly suppressed from the birth control pill exposure over such a long amount of time. If it looks like your ovaries are suppressed, the volume of the ovary is lower, the follicles that we're seeing are very small, your estrogen is very low, your FSH is low, the different hormones that we check are low, then in order to get a, the most robust response that we can get from, from a cycle, I often will in those individuals recommend coming off the birth control pill for one cycle for about a month and then reassessing to see has the ovary sort of increased in its volume, has, you know, are the hormones sort of more where we want them to be? And then we can get started with, um, uh, with the stimulation because again, we want to optimize the outcome, right? You're going through obviously a lot here. Um, if we, you know, wait a month, say, and get, get a better yield of eggs, then it's hundred percent worth it. In some situations, the, if let's say, if you've been on birth control pills for 15 years or what have you, um, there, the maximum amount of time that will be needed as sort of like a holiday or a break off the pills is about three months. Um, I would say that that's on the more extreme end of things, typically within one month, you're in a good position. Um, and so, you know, and, you know, and so you may not have to be now, if you've been on the birth control pills for eight years, 10 years, whatever have you, and we do an ultrasound and blood work, and it appears that you're not suppressed, that the ovaries have not shrunk down, that they look sort of quote unquote normal, then you can actually, you can absolutely continue on birth control pills until the day that you're ready to get started. Um, so again, we just personalize that decision, whether or not you stay on birth control pills um, or not. Um, next question. Um, does the cycle bring in back to the time? So uh, so, okay. So the question is, is how do um, cycle lengths impact uh, this process? Um, so average menstrual cycle length is 28 days. That's average, but most people don't actually have 28 day cycles, but that's just sort of what the average, what it averages out to. Um, if you have, and it's sort of the range that we consider in the quote unquote normal range is as minimum low as 21 days and as high as 35 days. Um, having menstrual cycles on either side of that, um, it doesn't really impact the process in terms of how we may, you know, how many eggs we may end up getting. But if you are on, you know, have two short cycles or two long cycles, there may be some sort of underlying condition that's predisposing to that going on. It could be that it's related to the total number of eggs that you have being too low or too high, or you know, it can be too high. Um, and so that may impact, you know, the, your outcome ultimately, but it doesn't mean that we can't do this. Um, it, can it impact fertility? Again, we want uh, cycles to be within that range because that tells us that people are ovulating. Um, all right, we'll go through as many of these as, as, as we can. Um, so another question about being off birth control pills to do the testing. Uh, you don't, again, you don't need to be off the birth control pills. We can do the testing and then, um, and then um, uh, uh, do it. But a question about an IUD. Um, IUDs can stay in. Um, we love IUDs, keep them in, whether it's hormonal or not hormonal. The IUD really is, is having its contraceptive effect at the level of the uterus. And we think of the ovary, the ovary is a separate organ from the uterus and our focus really here in the egg freezing process is on the ovaries. Um, so if on birth control pills, do you continue the birth control pills throughout the stimulation? Um, the answer is no, you take the birth control pills in the, in the, you know, leading up to the stimulation. Once you're starting the hormone injections, you stop taking the pills. You can restart the pills once you get your period after the egg retrieval, which again is one to two weeks after the egg retrieval, depending on the type of trigger that you take. Uh, so the question about cost, um, the cost is, it depends, so a lot of it depends on whether or not you have insurance coverage or not. If there's insurance coverage, there's insurance coverage, it's great. Um, 
the you know average cycle call cycle costs in the ballpark of about ten thousand dollars or so there are financial plans and different options to help reduce those prices or make it more affordable um but we have actually a financial team um that's here um the, the cost of medications also can be separate depends if you need a high dose of medications or low dose and different pharmacies have different, different discount programs and so there's a lot of resources that that are uh that are out there that can help make the process more affordable um, because you know we we obviously want to make this accessible to accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, does everyone have to go on birth control pills before the process? The answer is no. Um, it again it depends on your hormone profile. We may recommend it or not. In some situations, we start just with with what we call a straight start, which is um, the beginning of your cycle. Um, or in some situations, we put you on an estrogen patch, which is a little sticker you put on the skin about a week after you ovulate. It really depends on what your individual hormone profile is and how we think we can get the best outcome for you. So it, birth control pills, I would say, is the more one of the most common ways that we synchronize follicles to get ready for a stimulation, but not the uh, it, you know abs, you know it doesn't have to be part of the equation because uh, there are you know obviously a lot of people who. Um, you know, who don't tolerate birth control pills well or have contraindications to it. Uh, insurance, what insurances do we accept? So we accept pretty much all commercial insurances. Um, so like private insurances, not the uh, Medicaid spectrum ones uh, or Obamacare. Um, we have on our website, um, uh, you'd be able to, um, you know, to see which, which um, ones we cover. And when you call um, to make an appointment, they'll tell you if we accept your insurance, if you're covered for the initial consultation. Um, and if uh, once, you know, once we see, you know, make a treatment plan, we can submit to the insurance to see if they'll cover a lot of, I would say most of my patients actually do have insurance coverage. Um, um, and if not, then again, it's in the ballpark of about 10,000 or so, like including you know, medication, all the different things that you need. But again, there are a lot of different, there are financing options, there are discount programs, there are different things that, you know, payment plans, et cetera. There's different things that, that can be done to, again, make it more accessible. And we have a whole financial team that, that um, specializes in that. Um, so question, another question is how may uh, PCOS affects egg freezing. So PCOS stands for polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, it's a condition where basically um, you're born with a higher amount of eggs than average. So there's, you know, there, there's sort of, it's quote unquote being in the abnormal range if you're born with too few eggs, that's the ministerial ovarian reserve, or being born with too many eggs is PCOS. PCOS, because you have so many eggs, causes a bit of a hormone imbalance and people don't ovulate and may have infertility. Um, but PCOS also sometimes, because of the abnormal hormone environment, can um, also impact the quality of eggs. Um, the the you know just because of the hormone environment that they're growing in. Um, the PCOS actually is something that ends up being very beneficial, um, sort of a diagnosis that helps out the egg freezing process. Because again, if you have more eggs from a stimulation, you probably will end up with a higher than average number of eggs. And so people with PCOS. Um, uh, you know, at our higher risk for hyperstimulation for complications, but it's 100% something that we're able to do in a safe way um, and typically ends up with a higher egg yield. And so PCOS patients may end up being able to get away with just doing one round of egg freezing and having enough. Um, another question about insurance, which I think we addressed. Another PCOS question, which we address. Um, is there an oldest age at which to get eggs frozen? It's a very good question. So, you know, the younger the better, obviously. Um, when you're over the age of 40, is it's it's an option available. Um, but I would say that the preference in that situation would act would be to freeze embryos. Um, so what can be done if, you know, if, if able to freeze embryos with, with a partner or with donor sperm, that would be a preferred method um, because those, because the quality goes down so much, by the time you're 40, um, about a third of the eggs are healthy. And so, you know, again, you would need a, a really high amount of eggs in order to have a good amount of confidence and, you know, sort of show that graph before. Um, 
And so we encourage doing it under 40. Is it an option available over 40? Yes, but we have to talk about what that means, particularly with your ovarian reserve. If you're over 40 with a really good ovarian reserve, and you may of two, three, four, what have you, um, then you know this could be a you know a good investment. Um, if you're over 40 and have diminished ovarian reserve or have a very low egg number, and we may only be getting five eggs from one cycle. And in order to get, you know, so we're still looking at doing five, six rounds of this to get it to get a meaningful impact. That's again, it's a conversation to be had. It's definitely not an exclusion from doing egg freezing, but the, you know, the, you have a better outcome and uh, when you're younger, um, having some eggs frozen is better than having none. Uh, three, nine, uh, okay, so um, again, someone who's uh, asking about 39, it's a 40 transition. Um, you know, I would say the sooner the better. Again, there's nothing magic that happens when you wake up on your 40th birthday and all of a sudden we can't freeze eggs anymore. Um, you know, and the quality goes down and whatnot. Yes, it goes down more rapidly in the late 30s, early 40s. Um, it's an option that's available. It's just a matter of understanding. I think that what really informs that decision is knowing what your ovarian reserve is like. Again, if you have a really good ovarian reserve and we feel good about it, then you know we go ahead. If it's a very low ovarian reserve, um, then it's something that we just have to give a bit more thought to. Uh, so what happens to eggs uh, or good quality eggs that aren't used? So this is a good question. Um, the Eggs, so say you freeze eggs and circumstances change and you end up you know, building a family on your own and don't use these eggs. The eggs will stay frozen essentially indefinitely and we hold on to them up until certain points. So say you get to over a certain age, over like say 55. Um, if you decide that you want to discard the eggs, that's also an option. If you decide you want to donate them to research or what have you, those are different options. So the disposition of the eggs can be variable. Again, if you are if you freeze eggs and then you don't end up needing to use them uh, to build a family, um, we either can keep them frozen or we can uh, or or we can discard them. Or, again, or donate to research. Um, monthly uh, storage. So each, you know, program is, is a little bit different. Um, these and the storage costs get, are variable and they change with time. So it could be one way this year and then changes the next year and whatnot. Um, I would say that across the board in New York City, I have a pretty good sense of like the New York City landscape is about $1,000 about a year or so. Or like, you know, 100 a month or whatever. So somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, and that also can be that something is sometimes covered by insurance and sometimes it can be uh, all right. um, in terms of diet or lifestyle uh, modifications uh, in time before the process. Great question. Um, so the so the um, in terms of diet there's not really any specific type of diet that's good for egg health. Now we postulate that a Mediterranean style diet is good overall. Um, and so, you know, that's something that I would say could be introduced if it's not something that's just gonna, you know, that you don't have, you're not very averse to. Um, so there's not any specific diet. I would say we don't want you being at McDonald's every single day, right? Uh, leading into it, we want to be as healthy as possible. Um, in terms of lifestyle things, um, there are important things here. Um, one is any sort of inhaled smoke um, can create, you know, so with cigarettes, marijuana, et cetera, cigarettes much more so, um, can create what are called free radicals in the bloodstream, and that can impact the quality of the eggs. And that can be hang around for up to three months or so. Um, and so I would say if thinking about doing the process, you want to eliminate, certainly smoking um, has to be eliminated completely cigarettes, um, because the, you know, the components of cigarettes in conjunction with the hormone injections is a setup for a blood clot and is actually a contraindication. So we can't have you smoking and then doing, and, and then doing the injections, you have to stop the smoking for three months before we start the process. Uh, marijuana smoke, um, again, limit as much as you can, certainly during the stimulation itself, um, there, there's, there's none of that. We also would say to avoid um, during, you know, during the actual hormone injections, you're avoiding alcohol as well. Uh, in the time, say months, you know, month or two leading into it, 
um, to try to avoid binge drinking. Um, but otherwise, you know, a couple of drinks a week is, is okay. Things in moderation are okay. Um, as a rule of thumb, like in the trying to conceive time, which is really where we can extrapolate from, having up to four drinks in a week is what we consider um, acceptable. Obviously, you know, when trying to get pregnant once after you ovulate, then you stop, but I'm talking about in the early phase of the cycle. Um, so that would be what I would say would be, you know, wise to do. The eggs that are coming forward from an egg freezing cycle, the body starts to work on at a microscopic level about two and a half to three months before. So that's, you know, so that you don't have to be, uh, you know, Every, you know, everything free and, and lifestyle things that are happening for six months or a year before starting. Um, so initial course, fertility tests, et cetera, um, again, just depends on your insurance. Um, and so I would say if you reach out to the clinic, they'd be able to give you, whenever I talk about financial things, they tell me that I'm giving, I'm giving some rule false or outdated information and I should stick with what I know, which is the medical part. Um, and, uh, uh, again, another question about, uh, costs and storage fees and things like that. Uh, again, there's different ways that it's set up. It's annual, it's semi-annual, it's monthly. There's, there's different ways that it gets sliced. All right. Um, and I think that is everything. Uh, no. Um, okay. So, uh, another question um, is about being on um, medications, uh, antidepressants, or different type of pre uh, prescription medications during the process. Um, most of the medications um, that are given as antidepressants are safe to take during the egg freezing process. Um, as part of your initial intake and consultation, we go through all the different um, all the different medications that you're taking and all your medical histories and things like that, and we tell you what you can continue, what you cannot continue. Um, and another question, sorry, um, so, um, so another question about, say, you say you freeze eggs here in New York, and then you end up leaving, uh, leaving New, either New York, going to a different state or going internationally and whatnot. The eggs can be, uh, stored here. They can be frozen here. Um, they can stay here again indefinitely or, if later on, um, you know, in your life, you're in a different country or a different state or whatnot, the eggs can be uh, very safely moved to that location. Um, and, you know, and, um, you know, it, it can be done. It happens all the time. Um, a question about whether or not any of the expenses are tax deductible that I, I don't know the answer to. I'm sorry. Um, is there a risk for a uh, higher risk for miscarriage with eggs um, as opposed to naturally implanted? Um, so it's a good question. It depends on uh, the age at which uh, you know you're trying to conceive versus the eggs that are that are uh, frozen. Um, and so an egg that's frozen at age 30 has a lower chance of miscarriage um, than naturally conceiving at age 40. Um, if you say, but these eggs, but say you have a 30 year old frozen egg and you're naturally trying at 30 as well they're equal in terms of miscarriage rate. Okay, all right. All right, well, this, I hope that this was informative. Um, it was, uh, I can't see anybody, but it was a pleasure. Uh, uh, so one more question, sorry. Uh, I just said what drugs I should take. So. The question is, is how do we decide which medication a person should take for the, for the stimulation? Um, so this is, we have a bunch of different types of protocols that we can use in order to stimulate the ovaries. Um, the type that we use um, is going to depend on what your ovarian reserve testing is, your hormone levels, the ultrasound that we see and how many eggs we're seeing there, uh, your AMH, your body mass index, which is a, a measurement that we take based on your height and weight. Um, your age, these are all different things that we factor in into the dose of medication and the type of medication that we're going to give you. And again, we always personalize that sort of thing. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, we keep having more pop up. Okay. Freeze this side. So if you freeze eggs at 30, but decide to try to conceive at 35, should you use the frozen eggs or try natural conception? So we would always uh, prefer natural conception over frozen eggs. Um, again, we think of this sort of as 
to use in some ways as a backup um, and can use this say for kid number two or three or four or whatever have you down the road. Um, when the time, you know, if say you freeze your eggs and a few years go by and you're ready to try on your own, you try on your own. Um, something that, you know, we acknowledge is that is that, the, you know, it's a, you know, this is a great process, obviously, um, but uh, natural conception is always is always preferred over one that's assisted. And we have this available um, to help meet family building goals if needed. OK. All right. So uh, our time we're at time now. Um, again, it was really a pleasure um, uh, to, to speak with you all, even though I can't see you. Um, I hope that uh, we all learned um, and um, had some questions answered. And again, um, if wanting to do um, a, you know, a personalized evaluation of your status, you can see either myself or one of my colleagues here at RMA of New York, um, and we'd be happy to take care of you.